Welcome to the Green Wasp Removal YouTube channel. This is part 5 of the Polistes Dominula European Paper Wasp Nest Development Series, documenting a complete season for this nest from the time it was discovered in May of 22 through November of 22. For the best viewing experience, you may want to check out our YouTube channel playlist to look at all the previous parts of this series prior to watching this particular section of the series. We also recommend you set your YouTube viewing settings to the highest quality image you can get. Let's begin with a five minute preview of this series. This video was shot in the USA, in the state of Indiana, and North America. In this series, we show you the entire life cycle of a European paper wasp colony. That's Polistes dominula. From the time it was discovered in May of 2022, when it had maybe a dozen new cells built, all the way through midsummer when it peaked in size with over 200 cells built on the nest, till the end of the nest life cycle in October, November of 2022, when it wound down and the population died off and flew off to mate. We'll show you the cell count that were visible during each of the growth stages it went through. It was fun to document how fast they were building out this nest. We'll show you all the drama these two co-founders queens went through as they defended their nest from predators of all sorts that wanted to eat their eggs or larvae or parasitize their nest. We watched them fight off spiders and mites and ants and parasitic insects. The ants in particular were very aggressive and they kept attacking the nest. You'll see this ant crawled right into one of the cells and tried to eat one of the eggs right there. The wasp turns around, sets off her alarm buzzing wings, and she grabs it by the leg and throws it right out of there. This was a very common occurrence. It was a daily thing, having to fight for their nest, fight for their territory. We couldn't help but be impressed at the number of times they used their wasp judo, just grabbing the leg or the antenna of the invader and just chucking it off the nest. There were parasitic wasps coming at them. They were always on alert and vigilant. They fought off mites and they fought off other types of insects that attempted to live in or around the nest. There's a whole related ecosystem of insects that target wasp nests and wasp larvae. We'll show you what it looks like when the wasp queens lay eggs inside the cells, which is what you see here. We'll show you all the life stages inside the nest, from the eggs to the newly hatched larva to the mature larva, all the way through to the pupating larvae that become adult wasps when they chew their way out of the cell after pupation. And we'll also show you what it looks like when the pupating wasps who have developed through the egg and larva stage are born and chew their way out of the pupating silk caps that they cover their cells with. And we'll show you the process of how they go out to forage for wood fiber which they collect off of aged wood and they fly it back to the nest where they will inspect the nest and decide which cell they want to work on and they'll build each cell one at a time and they'll maintain any that need repair with that material. We'll also show you how they bring back insect protein that they hunt in the wild, they share it with each other, and they maloxate it, which means they chew it up into a fine pulp and they use that food to feed their larva. And we'll show you that process in detail. You don't have to watch a wasp colony very long to find out what good biological control agents they are reducing populations of insects around your property. Unfortunately, with invasive species, this goes both ways. It can be damaging to the local ecosystem if they're reducing the amount of resources available to our native wasps who rely basically on the same insect population to feed their larvae. We'll show you how they bring nectar back and create a honey-like substance for food. They also bring back water and they attach droplets to the cell walls to hydrate the nest and keep it cool. We'll show you the process of trophallaxis, which is where they engage in mouth-to-mouth -mouth exchange of fluids. You'll see how the two foundresses engage in dominance behavior, such as here where they're nipping at each other and headbutting each other. And you'll see as the dominance hierarchy becomes established on the nest, the alpha female will shake her abdomen like a rattlesnake and she'll sort of nibble at the heads of the others until they drop their antenna and bow down to the queen and, and that's how they maintain dominance on the nest and we'll show you examples of that. We'll show you how later in the season 
the males begun to be born in the nest and the reproductive females who are going to be queens the following season after they hibernate they'll go out and start colonies so the goal of this video is to show you the complete life cycle of a polistes diminula nest the european paper wasp they're very very common now as invasive species here in north america you will probably see these this upcoming spring and summer so keep an eye out for these and we hope when you see them next you'll know exactly how they operate as always we thank you for being here we had a great time in the six months that we began the channel in 2022 and we hope to bring you a lot more fun content in 23. here we'll step back in time to june of 2022 We'll pick up where we left off at the end of part four. We'll start part five on June 18th of 22, when over 70 cells were visible on the nest. Here on June 18th, we see our primary alpha foundress or queen that we call three dot because she has three marks on her face or her clippius. We see her preparing a cell to lay an egg in it. And if you've seen the previous episode, part four, you'll know that she's attempted to lay an egg in this same cell several times already. And for some reason, she's back again laying another egg in there. Now, typically, they only lay one egg per cell. So that tells us either she's having trouble getting this egg attached to the side of the wall of the cell, or the other adult wasps on the nest have been removing her eggs when she's laying them and she has to relay the egg in the cell again because the other wasps maybe are removing it and what happens occasionally on wasp nests is the alpha foundress will eat the eggs of others so that she maintains dominance on the hierarchy and she'll replace those eggs she eats with her own eggs that may be happening to her perhaps the other adults are eating her eggs and she has to relay them we're not quite sure but here she is again today laying another egg this takes a couple of minutes. We'll show it to you in real time uh, just because it's an interesting process. They will use body fluids that sort of glue the egg to the side of the cell wall. They don't put the egg in the bottom of the cell. They attach it to the side of the cell. If you look here in the other cell, you can see an egg attached to the side of the wall. It's in the red circle here. So we can assume she's putting one like this in the cell she's in now. And for some reason, she's attempted this several times, and either the eggs are being eaten by ants that attack the nest, or by the other wasps on the nest for competitive reasons, we're not quite sure. Either way, we'll watch her finish up here while we listen to the atmospheric sounds of the neighborhood they're in. The barn they attached this nest to is adjacent to a busy street, so you'll hear some traffic, you'll hear some neighbors, maybe some birds in the trees. So here she finishes up and she'll do her usual routine which is to check on the egg to make sure it's secure on the side of the wall of the cell and then she'll go on about her business. Here we see what looks like a parasitic wasp approaching the nest. This is a constant danger. Uh, the parasites that come after the nest can lay their eggs inside the larva and they can eat the larva alive in their cells while they're developing. Even the pupating wasps with the silk caps over their cell can be parasitized by the parasitic insects that crawl into the cell and chew through the wall and then lay eggs in or on the wasp larva. 
parasitic wasps are tiny and they can get into these nests in many ways. Here we'll slow the footage down and blow it up a little bit so you can see this insect better. It's a little hard to identify them from such a quick piece of film, but that's probably what this is. Although winged ant is possible or another type of insect is certainly possible, but parasitic wasps are often that size and do have that similar look. Parasitic wasps are actually a fascinating thing. They will help control, biologically control, a lot of pest insects in the world. So it's really, really important that they survive. Because there's many, many, many species of them and they'll attack all types of garden pests and they'll keep other insect populations in check. So we need them as well. So they're not always the enemy. In fact, Australia has had a lot of problems with imported invasive species of yellow jackets, mostly German yellow jackets and common yellow jackets imported, they think, from international trade. And because they're a huge problem there for agriculture and other things, they're researching how they can use parasitic wasps and also parasitic mites to try to control in a biological way without poison all of these overpopulated invasive species of yellow jackets over there. Here we see one of the foragers come back with some food. It's a large piece of maloxated insect meat and this was brought back by one of the brand new wasps who was just born in the last episode or so and this would have been a wasp who was pupating only a couple of days ago and now is an adult forager. They learn this routine very quickly and they become very functional members of the nest. You see them doing trophallaxis with each other which is the mouth-to-mouth -mouth feeding and you see the other one on the right has taken the meat from the forager and she's now maloxating that meat which is chewing it up into a fine pulp and she'll feed that meat to the larva. So our newest wasps are becoming very functional members of the foragers. Here we'll speed up the footage a little bit while she maloxates that food and then we'll show you how she will lean into the cells and feed the larva when the meat has been maloxated enough that she believes it can be eaten directly by the larva. Here you see her leaning into various cells as she goes about her business, feeding each one a little bit of that maloxated insect meat. These will be the next grouping of larva who will weave their silk caps and go into pupation soon so they get most of the food that comes in at this point. And at this developmental stage, they can eat a ton of protein because they're going to need that to spin their silk caps and then go through the whole metamorphosis process in which they become adult wasps inside the pupating cell. Here one of the wasps returns with some wood pulp. We're going to show you this in high speed. She's going to come over and start working on a cell to the left of frame after she inspects the whole nest looking for a place to start building the cell. And she chooses this cell here on the left and begins to go to work on it. Notice how her antenna guide her the whole way. The antenna give her most of the input she needs to make a perfectly uniform cell in the same pattern all the other ones are made in. Even though she didn't necessarily make every one of these, she knows exactly how to make it to size so that it's uniform. Here we'll watch some dominance behavior from the Alpha Queen who's on the nest to the right of frame. She's aware that there's a forager coming back right now and she greets that forager with dominance behavior, you'll see her shake her abdomen. If you listen carefully to the audio here, you can hear it. It sounds like a rattlesnake on the nest when she shakes or vibrates the abdomen. The sound you hear when she shakes the abdomen is from scraping across the top of the nest. She doesn't actually have anything in her body that shakes like that. But the bottom line is that vibration and that sound teaches the others on the nest that she's the boss. She's the dominant alpha queen on the nest and they are subordinates. Here we have two wasps back at the nest building at the same time. They're each building a cell, one at the top of the frame, one at the lower left of the frame. We'll do a split screen image on high speed here so you can see both of them completing their cells at the same time. As the nest grew into later June here, this started to happen a lot more often. There'd be a lot more simultaneous work happening on the nest. You'd see cells being built over here. You'd see larvae being fed over there. You'd see food being delivered over here. You could tell they were ramping up production on all fronts. If you listen close here, you can hear the dominance vibration again.
Here's another good example of trophal axis where one of the foragers comes back and they start trophal axis immediately. This is pretty much the routine. Every time one of the foragers comes back, that forager will get mobbed by the others and the others will either take the food that it brought in or they'll do trophal axis to share fluids. It's pretty common to see that. Here's another example of a cell being built. We'll speed that footage up for you so you can watch the process. We'll show you a couple of different cells being built around the nest in high speed here over the next couple of clips. Here the alpha foundress once again appears to lay an egg in the same cell we've seen her lay an egg in three or four times now over the last couple of episodes. So it's unclear why she keeps dropping eggs in this particular cell. It may be that the others just keep eating the eggs. We're not quite sure, but uh, here she goes again. She's in labor and she'll sit there for a couple of minutes until she passes the egg into the cell. We'll put this on high speed for you until she's done. Here's another example of abdomen stretching where we've slowed this clip down so you can see it better. The wasp will open up the end of its abdomen and stretch out its stinger and expose its venom sac. And it may do this once or it may do this several times in a row like this one you'll see. And we're not entirely sure why this behavior exists. It's probably to lower the body temperature of the wasp. That's also why they rest inside the cell like you see this one doing. It's typically cooler. Uh, inside the cell than it is out on the hot air of the top of the nest. But it's a unique behavior. We see this uh, often with wasps. Here we see the foundress at the left of the frame approach one of the workers up at the top of the frame and she'll start drumming her antenna on its head and nibbling at its face while it lowers its antenna for her. And this seems to be a signal from the foundress, the alpha queen, to get off the nest and go forage. So that's what you see. This wasp takes off and goes to forage. And she seems to do this behavior pretty routinely with most of the adults on the nest to keep them active, to keep them supporting the nest. Listen carefully here and watch the wasp at the bottom who's a dominant queen. You'll hear her shake her abdomen while she moves aggressively toward the other wasp. And that's probably a signal to get back to work. And here it happens again. show you again and freeze that frame. You see how the subordinate lowers its head and lowers its antenna to the queen. All part of the hierarchy behavior on the nest. Here's another example of that. Truffle axis happens first and then there's antennal drumming on the face and the nipping at the face. Uh, all that is dominance behavior. You'll notice the wasp down at the lower left is building a cell so that one does not receive the same type of dominance behavior. And you'll notice the, the wasp that just did receive that behavior is now up on the left of the frame, the upper left of the frame, sort of hiding out of view. When that one comes back and still hasn't gone out to forage and still isn't working, she receives some more of the dominance behavior from the alpha queen. You'll see the queen kind of addresses her, sees her again, and then talks to her. Bing. Shakes the abdomen. Gives her a little bit more of the dominance mauling, they call it, where they nip at the head and the face and they do the antennal drumming on their head. And ultimately, that one finally is being driven off the nest to go forage. Here she's shaking at her again, giving her more of the dominance behavior. And that one finally got the hint and is starting to fly, but it's still a brand new wasp. It's a young wasp. It's not quite entirely sure how this works. The queen keeps going after her, pushing her off the nest, basically telling her to get out there and forage.
She's still hanging on, doesn't quite want to go yet because she's brand new to this whole flying foraging thing. But the queen just keeps driving that message in until she gets her off the nest. There she goes. Meanwhile, our other wasp is hard at work finishing off that cell down on the lower left. So she's being left alone by the dominant queen. And that's the whole job of the dominant queen, the alpha queen. She's out there to make sure this nest survives by keeping all of the workers working. There are times when she lets the wasps rest, but when she thinks they ought to be working, she's going to go after them. Here the new wasp that was just told to go out and forage is trying to return to the nest. It's landing on the nest for one of the first times. You can hear it coming in, buzzing past the camera, trying to get past the lens, protecting the camera and all that. The new wasps have to learn how to navigate the glass we put between the camera and the nest. And once they figure that out, they can get back to the nest. And then the Alpha Queen immediately does truffle axis and dominance behavior just to check what this wasp has been able to forage. Doesn't look like it was able to get anything yet, but it will. The new workers become very productive, very fast. Here one of the foragers comes back with some wood pulp and gets to work building another cell down at the lower part of the frame. We'll speed that up just for time. Here we see how when the forager returns, it's immediately mobbed by the other ones who check out what it has. That, that's a very typical behavior. They will often share food this way or do truffle axis and share fluids. So you can see how some of the newer wasps are allowed to take a break and put their heads up into the cells where it's cooler while others are run off the nest to forage. It all depends on the whims of the queen. Here a forager returns with some food and shares some of it and then actually drop some of it onto the protective lens glass. You'll see it drop here in a second and hit that glass. That's the reason we have a piece of glass in between the nest and the camera itself. You see it just dropped down here to the corner, right corner of the frame. There was quite a bit of debris that comes down from the nest that would otherwise hit the camera. We learned early on in this series to make that protective lens happen pretty quickly. You can see in one of the first episodes, one of the wasps dropped a huge uh, regurgitated blob of something onto the actual camera lens. And from that point, we started putting glass in between the nest and the camera. Here we see the Alpha Queen engage in a little more dominance behavior towards a couple of wasps. Here you see her nipping at the abdomen of one of them. And then she comes over and drums on the head of this one and it lowers its antenna to her. And this is pretty constant behavior. Here we see one of the adult wasps on the nest chewing away at the silk cap of one of the pupating wasps and tearing a hole in that silk. And we're not sure why this is occurring, but in one of the previous episodes, you might have seen how they pulled one of the pupating wasps out of its cell and killed it and ate it. And that could have been what was about to happen again here. We're not exactly sure, but it, it appears that uh, they did not complete getting that silk cap, but they did get a pretty good sized hole in it. We'll speed the footage up here so you can see this behavior. As you can see, it just kept going and going, chewing at the small silk fibers that make up the silk cap until it finally starts to put kind of a horseshoe shaped hole in the silk cap. And you can actually see down into that cell where the pupating wasp is now. And it's unclear if that pupating wasp is alive or if it's not alive or what this behavior was for. But all of a sudden, by itself, the wasp just stopped suddenly and sat there, just stopped that behavior completely. It then just wandered around the nest and went about its normal activities. But then all of a sudden, about eight minutes later, it came back and went at that same cell again. And it basically did the same thing. It just chewed away at it for a while. But uh, ultimately, all of a sudden, at one point, it just decided to stop and suddenly just stopped and left it alone. And we never did see that cell get attacked again. Just unusual behavior. 
Here another wasp returns to the nest from foraging, brings back a little piece of food, and then hands it off to the other wasp who takes it and malixates it. And that wasp goes ahead and feeds the larva. We'll speed up the malixation timing for you and then let you watch it feed the larva mouth to mouth. So these are in high speed sometimes to show this. You see how she goes cell to cell to cell, giving a little morsel of that food to several of the most mature larva. And we'll wrap up the footage from June 18th, 22, with a little profile shot of the nest, just to show you that angle. The following day on June 19th, we did the same thing. Just wanted to get a quick three-dimensional look at the nest from several sides in the profile, and also underneath, just to illustrate the general shape of the nest, which is hard to get when you're looking always from underneath. It looks very round and flat from underneath, but when you go profile, you see a much better look at the true shape of it. As you can see, the wasps on the nest were very tolerant of a camera flying around <laughs> their nest, and they did not immediately attack, and that is typical of Polistes wasps. That's it for part five of the Dominulus series, and we'll see you soon for part six, so stay tuned. As always, thanks for being here. Have a good one.